Hi everyone, I'm Lainey. I'm the Wiser Graduate Community Director and I just want to extend a warm welcome and thank everyone for coming to this e-week celebration. It's so exciting having everyone here. Um, just to go over our brief Zoom code of conduct real quick, if you um, already have your cameras on, if you could please turn those on just out of courtesy to our speakers. And also, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute and ask them directly or put them over in the chat. Um, I also want to thank uh, our wise mentor, Sarah Johnson and Carrie Thompson from Duke Energy for being this evening's chat moderator. And lastly, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Mrs. Beth Ann Johnson, the Associate Director of WISE. Excellent, thank you, Lainey. Well, it is a delight to see so many fabulous women in one room together. Um, happy Engineering Week. What a great celebration <laughs> that brings us together. Um, as Lainey said, I'm the Associate Director of Women in Science and Engineering. Uh, normally, I would welcome you to stop by my office at any point in time, but like most of you, I am working remote or just going on campus as needed. So, um, but please, I'm going to drop my name and email in the chat so don't be a stranger but tonight we have an extra special celebration this engineering week on both community and sisterhood right we've got duke energy which is a fabulous employer right in our backyard in seneca at oconee nuclear station and their women in nuclear network so that is just so exciting before I welcome tonight's speakers, I wanted to see who I have in the room. Um, so this will require a little bit of participation on all your parts and it requires your cameras, so don't be shy. I won't ask you to speak, but I do ask that you wave your hands at me, okay? All right, so if you are a member of Alpha Omega Epsilon, AOE, wave at me. All right, I see Francis and Megan. Exciting, welcome, welcome. All right, if you're a member of Society of Women Engineers or SWEET, wave at me. Yay, I see Trinity, Sydney, Chloe, excellent. All right, if you're a resident of WISER, wave at me. All right, I see Anna, excellent, excellent, welcome. All right, if you are a WISE mentor, I see several of you. Oh, I like Sage Nice Dance. That's perfect. <laughs> Excellent. If you're a peer mentor. Excellent. Excellent. All right. If you're a peer wise mentee, wave at me. Excellent. Excellent. All right. If you're a win speaker or chat moderator, wave at me. Yay. You see the grooves. Nice. Excellent. All right. All right. Last question. If you waved your hand more than once, give me a thumbs up. All right. Allie's over here. She's she's in both. Right. Excellent. All righty. Well, at this time, I want to invite you to a very special woman, um, Miss Sarita Acker, the executive director of PeerWise, to give us a nice warm welcome. Well, I just want to welcome, I think Beth Ann has already done that very well. I'm just excited to listen in. I want to thank Duke Energy for your partnership. I mean, you're, you're in partnership with us in so many ways, project-wise, our summer camp, and now this collaboration. So thank you for coming tonight. To all the students, it's, it's just wonderful to see you. And I just hope that you'll be engaged and that we'll have a good panel discussion. For SWE, AOE, thank you again as well, WISER, wise mentors, everybody. So welcome and it's just good to be here. Thank you, Ms. Sarita. So you're all here to invest in your futures, right? So if you're a first year student here in the college, what does life after wise mentoring look like? Well, SWE and AOE are here to remind you that there is sisterhood. It continues once a wise family member, always a wise family member. And then Duke Energy is here to remind you that there's a life to wise after graduation, right? To invest in yourself by finding an employer that invests in you and has these beautiful networks. So without further ado, I give it to Lainey. Thank you, Beth Ann, and thank you, Ms. Sarita. I would like to go ahead and invite the Society of Women Engineers or SWE president to go ahead and ask their first question. 
Thank you, Lainey. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for, for joining us today. I'm super excited to hear from you. So first of all, we can just start off with some introductions as well as answering the question, why engineering? What or who has inspired you? Um, Jesse, can you start us off? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jesse Link. I'm a senior reactor operator at a Coney nuclear station. Uh, what that means is I'm primarily a control room supervisor. I also serve the role of the shift technical advisor. Uh, that means I'm kind of an engineering advisor for the operation shift. Um, I started in engineering after school because what I was good at was, was math and science. Um, really coming out of high school, I didn't know a lot of what I wanted to do. Beautiful thing about engineering to start with was you start off with general engineering and that was a path I took. Um, beyond that, I am also the uh, women in nuclear chair for a Coney site. Uh, women in nuclear is a national organization and uh, we do um, basically networking, public outreach and professional development for our nuclear fleets across the country. Thank you. Um, anyone else can follow up? Jesse, you want me to go? Yes, go ahead. Okay, um, I'm Spencer Pasqua. Uh, I'm a wife and I'm a mother of two. I have two kids, four and two, and I'm a nuclear engineer. Um, I have my master's in nuclear engineering. I started my doctorate and I'm thinking about finishing, but uh, I am an auxiliary operator at Duke Energy. My goal is to be what Jesse Link is one day. She has goals. Um, but I, I picked engineering pretty much out of high school. Uh, like Jesse, I also have a, a big passion. I'm, I'm very odd. I love math. I, I, I find, I like to have solutions to everything. So if there's a problem I can fix and I, I tend to see life in, in equations and numbers anyways. Um, I, I found nuclear engineering particularly interesting because I found a great correlation of my faith and, uh, and nuclear engineering because with both of those, you're believing in almost something you can't see. So nuclear engineering to me was fascinating because it's a lot of, um, uh, it's based on a lot of theory, neutron life cycle, uh, neutron life and uh, a lot of calculations that you can't really put your eyes on. But for me, it was, that's where I really, I, I, found, I found it just very fascinating. So that's why I picked nuclear engineering. Svetlana, would you like to go next for Duke? Yes, yes, yes. Hey, um, I'm Svetlana Kartner. I am a civil structural engineer at Akoni Nuclear Station. I have done structural design of concrete and steel structures, but currently I do seismic analysis of electrical and mechanical components. I have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and master's degree in structural engineering, both of them from UNC Charlotte. I grew up in a country called Belarus, which is former Soviet Union Republic. As a child, um, I always loved building, creating things, uh, designing things. So as it was time to choose my career path, I um, knew right away that it was going to be a technical field. So choosing civil engineering path was my passion. I knew I was going with my passion. Uh, my grandfather was a house builder. And my dad was electrical technician. Both of them were very surprised and nervous about my choice. Um, but since I was first one in my family to do um, to go to university, my was to make my family proud and to show them that I can do it. Sorry, it's emotional because there is a long history behind it. So when I was in university, um, I had an opportunity to come to the United States. So my education was in jeopardy. It's easy to choose going to the United States or continue education. So of course, opportunity to go to the United States comes very rarely, so I chose that. But um, regardless, I stuck with my goal, even not knowing English, I kept on going, no matter how hard it was. And it was tough, so um, I kept on going and I did my degree in um, uh, civil and structural 
And I love what I do. I love my job and I made my family proud. Oh, awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Svetlana. We're glad to have you as part of the Duke family now. We're glad that you <laughs> to join us. Greta, would you like to go next? Yes, I'll go next. I am Greta Sparks. I'm an electrical engineer with a Colony Nuclear. So my day-to-day -day, um, job is very interesting. Um, we are in charge of design basis on our systems. We do troubleshooting if anything breaks. We have to come up with solutions. And we also do analysis and calculations for questions and anything that comes our way. I uh, finished uh, a bachelor's in uh, double E from North Carolina State University. Now, I originally am from Albania, it's in Eastern Europe. I came as an exchange student in high school in the US and decided to go to college here. So English was not my strongest subject. <laughs> so, and I loved, I always loved math and science, especially physics. And my story is originally, I went to school to be a computer engineer. However, during my first years, when I was taking a lot of um, like the Java and computer science courses, I realized that coding all the time was not really what I wanted to do. So one of my best friends, I was discussing with her that what else can I do? So electrical engineering was another field that was similar to what I was doing from the subject standpoint. And the whole idea of can see a lot of things in electrical. So that was very fascinating for me. So that was really my why what I'm doing, what I'm doing today. Well, great. Thank you all so much for sharing. That's very inspiring. <laughs> well, before we go on to our next question, Sarah or Carrie, do we have anything in the chat we should address? Nothing in the chat right now, but if you ever have any questions, feel free to put them in. All right, well, thank you both. And now we will have Ali Smallwood, who is the membership educator for the engineering sorority Alpha Omega Epsilon. She will share our next question. Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here. Um, so most of the students on this call are undergrads or might experience being the only woman in their class. Um, so my question is, what can you tell us from your own undergraduate experiences um, and if you ever had any classes you struggled with, um, how you overcame that, and if you have any words of encouragement that you'd like to share. I'll go first. Um, so as far as being the only woman in your field, um, that can be challenging. There's, but some these days, thankfully, there's often one or two others. Um, but in addition to that, look for allies, um, you know, guys. There's plenty of them out there who are accepting and encouraging of women being out there. Um, just look for people who are encouraging and want to see you succeed and team up with them. Um, I know a big factor of my success is I got my mechanical engineering from Clemson University. And what helped me a lot is one day I just noticed this guy was in like pretty much every class I had that semester. And so I just came up to him. And I said, hey, do you want to study together since we basically have the same schedule? And he said, oh yeah, sure. And um, we ended up staying together for the remainder of our college experience. It ended up being three years of college that we did together. And then come the end of my education, he was the one who told me to apply to Duke Energy for a Coney Nuclear Station. So um, just reach out, form those relationships. There are people who want you there, so look for them. Um, as far as what my challenges were going through school, um, I struggled with, uh, pretty much stuff that was not what I was expecting. Uh, well, like chemistry, chemistry is not my strong suit. Thankfully, that's pretty short. Um, the other thing is calculus. I had never had pre-cal or anything going to college, so I was starting off behind the ball. Um, just make sure you're reaching out and using your resources that you have as far as when you have a, what, what is it called when there's a person there to help with the studying, the study lead and stuff, anyone? I forget what the what the teaching assistant 
Yeah, um, reach out to a teaching assistant, um, use the Academic Success Center. Uh, WISE, when I was there, had test bank. Make sure you're using all your resources. Um, I know statics and dynamics is like the dreaded class now. Um, I heavily use the, the, the teacher's assistant and the study groups for those. So just make sure you're never letting anything like that get away from you. You don't have to do it on your own. Uh, Spencer, you wanna go next? Yeah, yeah, um, I'll kind of go off what Jesse said. And I remember, it's funny, because I remember coming to you, Jesse, kind of about this topic. Um, me and Jesse have pretty similar personalities, I'd say, uh, we're very, well, I, I know Jesse's an extrovert. I'm, I'm very extroverted. I talk a lot. I'm very bubbly. Um, I, as far as, I guess, I was pretty much the only woman in my class. So, and and that that is, it can be daunting, but it can also be empowering. Um, and like Jesse said, yes, reach out. I, I don't really, my biggest struggle, I guess, was I, sometimes, you know, I, I guess being with all men and they see me as kind of this like bubbly airhead-ish, if that's, you know, in quotes, girl. And so, a lot of that was kind of pushing past that stigma maybe that I felt like other people had against against me just and and not being afraid of that just like embracing who I was and uh this is me I'm kind of loud and bubbly but and sometimes I ask dumb questions and that's okay but um reaching out you know regardless okay they made like like she said form allies most of my friends are were guys honestly just from class um but I remember coming and asking Jesse when I started here like gosh how do I this is kind of challenging. It's a different field to work in and how do I navigate it with people taking me seriously with kind of a personality like so. And, and um, but as far as, uh, I, I think as a woman though, um, and I was gonna talk about this later, but now it seems like the opportunity. Um, I also think we have such a strength because for me, I think we're, we are very good at compartmentalizing a lot and organizing. And I've seen it with Jesse. We're, we're always organizing sticky notes, everything. I watch her in the control room and we can stay on top of things. So that gives us the strength. So use those, use those strengths that some, some men don't have, you know, like utilize those, those strengths as a woman. Um, and then let's see, as far as classes that I did struggle, like Jesse, chemistry was tough for me. So thankfully very, I didn't have to take much, but um, yeah, utilize your resources. Gosh, I can't tell you the amount of YouTube videos I've watched and uh, chemistry and electrical engineering. I, oh man, I more power to people who can do electrical because it to me was very challenging uh, more than any of my nuclear classes. So, but utilize whether it be a, a, another guy in your class or um, a coworker or or the internet. I mean, I got a lot of my help off just watching YouTube videos from from people in their living rooms. So utilize all your resources, and pe pe you will find a lot of people are really happy to help. They want to help, so don't be afraid to do that. And don't be afraid to be who you are, because I, I was for a long time, and so I tried to kind of hide who I was, and then finally I just gave up. It's better to be who you are in this. <laughs> so that line, you want to go in next? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, yes, I I always was um, just the one or two women in, uh, in the group, like through college or during the work, um, all meetings, it could be just me. It is intimidating. And sometimes, um, even though you have a good thought or good idea to say, and you kind of think in all these men, maybe they they may be smarter, they may know more. Uh, so, but um, you just have to get yourself uh, together and um, you know speak out and say what you have uh, and try not to be intimidated. Um, but and with so many years, you think that this you will get used to be around men and lose that uh, um, intimidation. But I, I still sometimes worried and nervous. So um, it's natural for me. As far as classes, um, and as well, chemistry is not mine, <laughs> like uh, like everybody else. Um, electrical engineering, uh, I. Mm, that was tough for me. That's why I didn't wouldn't even go to that direction. But it's just me. Um, but my my dad, of course, was electrical. So um, it, every class was a struggle for me because of the language barrier, first of all. But I had to study hard. Um, that's the only way I could get through the classes and do very well. And I was following every professor for every class. Um, they knew me by name because I had to go and continuously uh, ask questions to make sure I understand correctly what was said in the class. So 
professors, um, teaching assistants, and I become became a teaching assistant myself afterwards to help others. Um, the best advice um, as my daughter right now is a freshman in um, biomedical engineering and she is saying, mommy is so tough. I said, well, if I could do it in a foreign language, you should be able to do it uh, knowing English 100%. So don't, don't give up, you can do it. <laughs> That's all I got. Greta, would you like to go next? Sure. So kind of like what's happening, um, being the only woman, most of the meetings, um, you still have that feeling, like she was saying, that maybe they're not taking you seriously. But the only way you can go through that is that you need to be confident in your abilities. You have to tell yourself that I am as good as them and it's probably better than them. So that's kind of how you tell yourself if you're feeling, you know, in those situations that you might be letting down or something like that. Uh, in school, kind of like Zetlana, English was not my uh, first language, so I had to study extra. Um, I st struggled in chemistry and statistics too, for some reason, I was having a hard time with that. I was exactly sure why, but, um, like Jesse said, I would advise use all the resources, go to the teachers when they have their office hours. If you don't understand something, go and ask questions. For me, a big thing was to study. Your mother always used to tell me, you know, tell you, surround yourself with people smarter than you are. And I think that's true. So in my study group, I had people that they're really smart. And sometimes the concept, it might take you a long time to understand, but you can ask that person sitting beside you and they can explain it to you and you can get it in like five minutes. So for me, that was a big difference. So you have to know how you learn, what's your style of learning too, right? Some people can learn better if they study by themselves and some people are better if studying with groups. So until you realize what is your learning style, that you can go from there. I think that's about it. Great, thank you. Now, I think I saw we had some questions in the chat. Are there still any that need to be addressed? Yes, we do have a few. So first one, does Duke help an employee who wants to go for higher education? And I'll just answer that because I'm the human resources consultant at our site. So Duke does. We have tuition reimbursement programs and heavily encourage continuous learning. So absolutely for that one. And then the next question is to describe a typical day for auxiliary, auxiliary operator versus a senior nuclear operator. So maybe Jesse and Spencer could, could tag on this one for us. Spencer, do you want to talk about your day? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's really interesting. I never thought I'd be doing, and Jesse, you'll have more insight on the control room uh, aspect. Uh, my day-to-day -day is a lot out in the field, turning valves, um, starting pumps, a lot of hands-on work, which I love. And I never thought I would really like it, honestly. Like, um, I'd been sitting behind a computer doing calculations, honestly, in my previous jobs. Um, and so I was like, oh, no, what am I, how am I, and that was, again, what, how, how am I going to go out and turn these valves with all these guys? And like, I'm, I'm not a very, I'm strong, but I'm kind of a slight person. And so I, I was very uh, insecure when I started on, I went to Jesse a lot about that. Like, Oh gosh, these, these people aren't going to take me seriously, but it has been so challenging and so awesome um, to really, to gain confidence in doing that. And to, it, it's, it's really awesome work being out in the field and, that's where that's my favorite place to be. It's it's out in the plant, and I love every bit of it. And I know Jesse, she she's had that experience. I don't have the control room aspect yet, but uh, I know she can speak more to that. And as being an AO, she can probably vouch for how fun it is. Yeah, Spencer, you'll get there soon enough. <laughs> being an AO was one of my favorite jobs. Um, before I was an AO, I was actually an engineer for like seven years before that. So to go from cube life to in the field was very exciting. Um, spent about two years as an AO, and after that, I went to um, get my direct senior reactor operator uh, license, 
Uh, most people, they'll do their reactor operator license and then um, their senior reactor operator license. But if with an engineering degree, uh, you have the opportunity to go direct. And so doing that um, is, is class for uh, right now, they do a one year program, but um, sometimes it's a year and a half, just depending on the size of the class. And then after that, you're basically in the control room every day. Um, so what I'll do is I come in, I take turnover. Uh, I get turnover starts at 5.30 a.m. We work 12 hour shifts. Uh, I'll do my turnover and I'll brief the other control room supervisor of um, activities going on, current issues, uh, work for the day. And then we'll basically um, plan out our day, whether we're running pump test, uh, valve stroke test. Uh, there's a lot of performance monitoring and testing that we do for um, re re uh, reactors. Uh, typically, a good day is a boring day, um, but we do test all of our safety systems very regularly. Um, if we have any issues, we're working with maintenance to resolve those issues and do post-maintenance testing. And um, really, it's just you're looking after the health of the plant. Um, after that, turnover starts, and then you turn back over. Another part I do is also the shift technical advisor. Like I said, that's usually kind of like an engineering advisor for the shift. I'm working out in an area called work control. And in that case, I'm actually working with the auxiliary operators to brief them on jobs and dispatch them to the field. Um, that can be that we're working on all three units when we're, whenever we're doing that versus when you're a control room supervisor, you're just assigned to one reactor unit at a time. Uh, that's all I got. Thanks for that, Jesse. We've got one more great question from the chat um, from Chloe that says, what do you love the most about being an engineer? What do you think your impact is as an engineer? So maybe Svetlana can start us off and then Greta. Sure. Um, I, I love that it, every day is different. Every day is something new, something um, you have to think. Uh, do you use the same basics? What I like, you have your book uh, that I, I still have my books from school. I kept them and time to time, you can't remember all those formulas and, and you need them sometimes. And so, so I go back to those books and, and looked at examples that I did back when I was in school. But um, the problem is every day different and it challenges you and it gets you working sometimes stress sometimes a little bit frustrated uh, a little bit frustrated and stressed but uh, once you resolve the problem once once you get to the solution once you design that item it um it it feels like like it's a reward it's it's a it's a great moment it's a great moment of reward this is what i like about my job so every day you can get a reward for accomplishing something I hope my connection is okay. I, I see you a little bit slow. Yeah. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. No. Hello? Yes, we can. We heard you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can you? Okay. Okay, because I see a little bit sl slowing down. Okay, okay so, so the, best, the best thing is you get the report. I'll let Greta, Greta, you have something else to add? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, um, the best part of the job for me is solving problems. Um, I always like to solve problems as a kid. I always ask why, why, why? And now I have a chance to solve the problem. That's like Svetlana said, that's very rewarding when someone comes with the issue and you work hard and sometimes it can be tiring you know, if you're working days and nights trying to solve the issue, but when you when you resolve the issue, that's very rewarding. You can say, I did that. I figured that one out. Any more questions? I think I saw one more in the chat. Yeah, we've got one more question. What is your work-life balance like as a nuclear operator? 
Ooh. Spencer looks like she wants to share. No, on that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I like look at all the faces. I saw Jesse too. Um, I think it's whatever you you can make it. I mean, I have two small children, two and four. Um, there, are t I, I tend to give a hundred and twenty percent in whatever I whatever I put my mind to. I guess so. Uh, there's been times where I have gotten wrapped up in studying for tests and Jesse knows, you know, before you actually be coming uh, down to the plan to be an AO, you do go through a lot of training and I had to make a hundred on all the tests. That's just my, per I'm kind of hard on myself. So I'd study all the time. And, and so you can, you, you have to set boundaries, honestly. Um, and I've, I've talked to other women here that um, in, in management positions that have said, look, you've got to when you're at work, your work, and when you're at home, you have to, you may have some nights where they, there are small amounts of time you're at home, but give all of you during that time. Don't think about work, put your phone down, put your computer down and just give it to your family. And I have, I've, that's something I've really, really had to struggle with because I tend to get so wrapped up in accomplishing this goal, accomplishing this goal. Um, but my real, my, the most important thing is my, my family. So. Jesse. Uh, yeah, so I can tell you about just the typical schedule that we work. We work a 10-week work, uh, ten week rotation. Um, you'll do four weeks on days where you work two weeks of 36 hours and two weeks of 48 hours. You do a week of training where you go up to the training center, and basically you're doing tests, classes, and simulator runs. Uh, and then you'll do four weeks on nights where it's two weeks of 36 and two weeks of 48, and then another week of training. So that makes for a full 10-week rotation. In addition to that, every year we have either one or two uh, outages. That's where we actually shut down the reactor and swap out about a third of the fuel. Uh, those outages can last typically these days, um, 30 to 20 days. We're actually going to go for our first sub-20 outage this year, so that's very exciting. We're all looking forward to that because that helps a lot with the work life. Um, during that time, it's all hands on deck, and we working what we call four and one, that's four days on and then one day off. Um, it's very intense, uh, it's, you, you, it's very exciting because at that time all systems are open, we're doing all kinds of work. Um, you get to see the reactor core opened up and um, you get to go in the reactor building. So um, while it can be very demanding, it's actually really, really exciting to do. So it's all really about what you want in life. So if you are really like, High action career. <laughs> this is it. For sure. And then a follow up question um, to the work life balance is when you leave work, are you able to leave work there? Does it infringe on your home life? Can you speak to that a little bit? Anybody who wants to speak on that one? I can speak to that because I've done both sides. Um, when I was in engineering, uh, Engineering is more of you have your assignments, you either have systems or components and stuff like that, and you are the go-to person for that. So you'll work projects throughout the day. Typically um, for Duke Energy, we do 410. So that's uh, Monday through Thursday, 10 hours a day. And it's really all dependent on the needs of the plant. Um, if something in your systems break, they'll reach out and they'll call you. Um, but again, as Spencer was talking about, it's all about the boundaries that you set because um, they will always be looking for more. There's so much work to do at the plant that really you gotta set what that boundary is. And then you gotta work with your supervisor to set those priorities. Um, as an operator, since you're a shift worker, when you're not there, someone else is doing the work. So the whole life balance ends up being a little bit easier because it's a lot easier for us to leave the plant and then not to call us because there's someone else fulfilling that role. That's it. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you. Um, next up, we will have, let's see, Dejanae Jackson, a wise mentor, share our next question. Hi, ladies. Um, I must say it is so refreshing to hear every lady's story and how relatable it is um, and inspiring too. Um, I guess our next question is, could you tell us um, about your career journey? Like, has nuclear engineering, has been into nuclear and in engineering? I'll go first. Um, so as I mentioned, I, uh, I've always worked at Oconee Nuclear Station. When I first came out of Clemson, that was the very first job I got. I've been there for a total of 13 and a half years now. Uh, first seven years I spent in engineering, I came in as a heat exchanger engineer. 
So I got to use a lot of my uh, thermo background. Um, after that, I also worked with valves. Um, then I moved over to what's called a raw water system engineer. So all of our systems that utilize uh, the Lake Huey waters, working through that. Um, and then after that, I was recruited by operations to work as an operator. I've been doing that for about six and a half years now. Spencer? Yeah, um, so straight out of college, uh, I actually started in nuclear medicine. Uh, so I worked uh, in proton therapy. Um, it was very, very interesting uh, and awesome. However, I love people so much and uh, sadly, cancer therapy doesn't always work. And so I had a very hard time in that profession because I, I couldn't deal with a lot of that. Um, so I switched gears. Uh, my husband uh, is a college basketball coach, so his job moves us around quite a bit. Um, I started at Nuclear Fuel Services. We make fuel for the Navy, we make fuel for the Navy, um, highly enriched. So I was a crit safety engineer there behind a desk a lot, lots of calculations, loved it, super fun. Um, but then his job took us here to Clemson. Uh, ironically, they had a nuclear plant, which I actually didn't know at the time. Uh, <laughs> so this was my first commercial nuclear plant. Um, and it's by far been my, been my favorite job. And the most rewarding to me as far as, um, there's always something to learn here. There's always a challenge. There's always something like, like there's never really a day that goes by where I'm not learning something new. Somebody's always teaching me. I'm always being taught. Uh, I'm always trying to figure out something, something different to me. I, I wake up every morning, honestly. And I, I, I'm, I love my job and people always laugh at me. They say, no, you don't like you're, that. You're full of it. Um, no, I really do. I love to get up and come to work. It's an awesome, it really is an awesome place to work. I can't, I can't say more good things about it. Um, it's awesome. We'll talk a little more. I see a question. A little more about experience in nuclear medicine. Yeah, so uh, I'll try to touch on it real quick. Um, I wanted to be a radiologist. Uh, so in I went to the University of Tennessee, um, and there, uh, there's it, there's really only when you go through uh, there was really only like a two class difference as far as radiological or commercial. Um, so I, I had pretty much both. Um, that I love the nuclear medicine is awesome. Radiology is a, it's a, it's a 14 or 15 year before you're actually, and I just, I couldn't devote the time really to it. Uh, so I, I started to get into, I was a medical physicist, um, or started in new, in medical physics. Uh, but like I said, I, I loved it. I, it was, it was that, that aspect was super rewarding working with people. And, uh, we, we treated cancer with, uh, protons. Um, which it's really neat if you ever want to look into that. It's it's a, it's very very awesome. But like I said, it was extremely hard for me to leave that at work because you're dealing with people's lives, and that was a hard pill to swallow uh, for me. So that's why I shifted. So, but I, I love commercial nuclear. It's it's awesome. You're welcome. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go next. Um, when I was in college, I didn't know where, where I will end up. Um, my senior year, I went to career fair at university and I went, started going through the booth and you know, there is um, wastewater treatment, mm, there is a road construction. Mm, um, mm -hmm. And there was a, a river representing a nuclear um, uh, career there. And it kind of interested me because um, well, I grew up in Belarus and it was the country that was hit 70% uh, by Chernobyl accident. I was a child when that happened. So that became very interesting to me. I started questioning the person who was at the booth about all these questions, you know, how, how is there a nuclear, I didn't even know that there were nuclear plants here. So, and, and he saw my interest and he said, well, how about you come to job interview? <laughs> so I said, sure. Uh, I gave him my resume and I went, um, you know, in a few weeks, I went uh, to, um, for interview with Arriva in Charlotte and they hired me. I asked all the questions. I was, I was so curious because I was so, all I know there was bad. It was bad because it destroyed so many families, so many people, so many people, um, I was sick from Chernobyl, from all the radiation. 
and I wanted to know why, what happened. That at that point, I, I became really interested in what's going on, why why that happened, and why you know what I can do personally to make sure that doesn't happen ever again. So when I was working for Ariva, I was doing really fun stuff. I was um, I was going to different stations. I was three three mile three mile island, which also had a accident by, back in, I guess, 1979 or something like this. <laughs> so it was, I was very curious what happened there. And we did um, component replacement, the steam generator component replacement, a lot of reconstruction inside of reactor building. It was, we, we did a lot of engineering calculations, drawings, it was fun. But when I was working with all the people at the station, with all direct employees, um, I, wanted that job. I wanted to be a um, employee of a nuclear station. So from that point, I was kind of working towards getting myself into the plant. And of course, opportunity came where I was um, contracting with, um, with um, Akoni nuclear station doing a project here uh, with Arriva. And I was approached by uh, one of the managers uh, and asked to <laughs> come for interview as well because there was opening. So that's how um, I went through interview and I was offered uh, a position here and I love it. <laughs> so this is why I ended up here. Greta, you're next. Next, okay. So, after I graduated from college, I actually worked at a design firm. They designed the wastewater and drinking water stations. But after working there for a while, I figured out that was not what I wanted to do. Um, so I knew that I wanted to work on the power side. So I'm sorry, I gotta plug in my, <laughs> my laptop's dying. I knew that I wanted to work for a power company. So I uh, interviewed with the uh, and uh, with the Oconee nuclear side. I, uh, I really liked the people I interviewed with. So I was really hoping, I really clicked with one of the managers. Um, and I thought if this person will give me a job, I will move to South Carolina and work for them. <laughs> so that's what happened. Um, they offered me a job. So I, was, I was living in Raleigh at that time. So that's how I ended up working at Oconee Nuclear Station. But I would recommend that if you can do internships when you're in college, just to see, because sometimes what you think you want to do might not be what it is that you want to do. So from my experience, um, when I graduated, I thought that's what I wanted to do, that I wanted to design. But when I was doing that work, that was not really for me. So if you can figure out some of that stuff before you actually graduate, I would recommend that you do that. That's all I have. Great, thank you. I actually have a question and it is, what is one piece of advice you would like to share with these young women on the call? Um, I'll go first. Uh, the the kind of like the overriding principle for myself is to be bold. Uh, don't, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. I mean, that starts with not being afraid to ask questions. Chances are, if you have a question, um, it's not because you're dumb, it's because you need to know it. And someone else probably also has the same question. So don't be afraid to put it out there because I mean, you think about all the times in you're in class when someone else asks a question and you think, oh God, thank, some thank God someone else answered that question. Um, you could be that savior for someone else. So don't be afraid to put, put yourself out there and ask those questions. Um, another part of being bold is to go for it. Uh, when opportunities come up, uh, take them. I mean, sometimes, you know, if something looks exciting and it, it kind of thrills you a little, it's probably a good chance that that's the direction you should be heading. Um, you're really going to get the most fulfillment out of following your passions. 
Um, I know whenever I did all my interviews, uh, I got offers in like manufacturing, cloth, foods, that kind of stuff. But really the, the most interesting job offer I had was nuclear. And even though um, the pay was a little bit less than some of the other positions I was offered, it was a lot more interesting. So I, I kind of asked them, I was like, well, could you meet me halfway or something? Could you do me a moving bonus? They upped my starting bonus a little bit and I ended up at a Coney. And um, it's been a really thrilling job to do. And then also the final thing is um, tell others uh, as far as being bold. And that has to do with tell others what your aspirations are, what you're interested in. Um, by doing that, first off, um, it kind of helps you be accountable to yourself because people are going to ask you about, hey, how's that going? You said you were interested in this. Are you still doing that? Um, and it'll kind of pick at you to, hey, you should keep going, you should keep going. Um, the other thing is also as far as your career path, uh, in any job, people are busy. And if you don't tell people you're interested in stuff, they're not going to know. They're not psychic. So um, I, I see a lot of young people make the mistake of, oh, well, I'll be recognized for my talents. And they just sit there and wait. Don't do that. Tell other people, hey, I'm really interested in doing X. I really want to do a cha change a career path, move up, whatever. Just put yourself out there and tell people what you want and be bold and go for it. That's it. Spencer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll kind of go on what uh, Jesse said, but great, all good advice. Um, just show up every day, uh, just as you are. Um, don't try to be someone else. Uh, like, like she said, be bold, but be confident. Um, I struggled so, so long for nothing, really, just because I cared so much what what people thought of me. If they would think I'm dumb, oh, they're gonna think I'm too much, too bubbly, too. They're gonna not take me seriously. And then I just got to a point where I was like, you know what, this is me. I'm just going to embrace it. And I'm going to try to change. I'm going to try to change how people see work. And um, if you if you love what you do, then I think you can really make an impact on people around you, um, to, especially today in today's times. I think as a woman, you really can write your write your ticket, um, show up, have drive every day, give 110 uh, percent. Don't give up. There will be I mean, I can't tell you the amount of days I've gosh, I can't do this. Back in my college days, you know, a test or a class, like I, I just, I, I literally, I, I called my dad so many, dad, I can't, this is too hard. And he'd say, no, no, you're, you're, in, you're going to make it. And I did every single time. Now, looking back, I see every single time that I never, that each moment I thought I can't do this. I've, I've always done it. And um, even going forward, uh, I, I have those moments now where I'm like, I go in the control room and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to learn this. And, and then you do, and then you get better every day. So just continue. And like Jesse said, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to reach out for help. Don't be afraid at all. Um, even if you think, oh, what are they going to think? It doesn't matter. Just, just ask anyways and just show up. So don't give up. Okay, I will go next. I'm the same message, don't give up. You already have a goal set up. You you chose to be an engineer. Keep on going. There will be roadblocks. Um, I had roadblocks. I had switched countries. I had uh, two babies during my education. I had full time job. Every time I'm thinking, mm, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Too much. And then I'm and then I set it as an inspiration, as a goal to test my limits to see how far maybe I can do it let me see and I and I test myself and I actually do it and I keep on going so make your uh, roadblocks your inspiration not excuses not not to continue just just keep on going work hard and you will achieve your goal and you will be proud of yourself and make everybody around proud I'll just follow on to that, uh, work hard, keep at it. Another thing to say is be a continuous learner. Continue to put tools in your toolbox. So after you finish college, continue, you know, to take your master's, you can pick another, anything that you can think of to be a continuous learner. And also have confidence, confidence and don't give up. Now, I believe we have some questions in the chat. 
that we should address. And then I also want to go ahead and take this time to open up the floor to any other questions. You can unmute, introduce yourself, and ask them directly, or also put them in the chat. Is it OK if I ask my question now? Go for it. OK, great. Um, hi, guys. My name is Frances Laughlin, and I'm actually being considered for a technician position at the McGuire plant. Um, and it was really great learning about you know, your, um, you know, your starts and what like a day would look like and sort of the shift breakdown. And I was wondering if you had any advice for sort of getting over that initial hurdle. I'll, I'll go first. So first off, congratulations on being considered. That's really, um, it's very competitive to be considered for operations uh, at the plants. We get tons of applicants. So um, you must be doing really well. You should be proud of yourself. Sure. As far as expectations, um, first thing coming in is uh, if you're going for a nuclear technician is you're going to have to pass what's called a POS test. It's basically a proficiency test. Um, there are examples of out there available on the internet. Make sure you go and reference those. Um, pull like a couple of them, go through them, make sure you're sharp and you're ready to go. Uh, don't feel, um, you don't have to complete 100% of the test. I know some people, they freak out because they think, oh, I got to do all of it. Um, you just need to score well. After that, uh, for the Duke Energy Fleet, we next take our operators into what's called basic operator training. Um, that is basically a course where we take you th through some really basic fluid dynamics, thermo, um, pump laws, and also reactor theory. Uh, that was kind of a struggle for me because I hadn't seen that before. Um, Spencer was probably pretty easy. Uh, after that, you'll be sent to your respective site to do uh, site-specific system training. Um, at Oconee, is 12 weeks. I'm not sure how long it runs at the other sites. Uh, basically, you'll be going through all the systems. Um, you'll be taught how they interact with one another, um, system interlocks. Uh, basically, so when you're out there and working on the plant, you can understand the impact that you could have on the plant. After that, you are um, an auxiliary technician and you're sent to the site and you begin on your qualifications. Uh, for that, basically, we have all kinds of job tasks that you'll be doing. And you'll be working with other auxiliary operators to get trained up to those tasks and get signed off. And once you work through enough qualifications, you'll go from tech one to tech two to tech three, and you'll get pay raises all along the way, of course, as well. Spencer, you got anything to add? No, um, to me, it, was, it, it sounds daunting. It sounds like kind of a long process, but it's, it's extremely fun to me. I like ever-changing things. I get, I can, I can get bored pretty easily. So to me, there's always a challenge. There's always another test. I actually like tests kind of like in a weird way. I, I like things to goals, right? So it's very goal. If you're a goal oriented person, you'll love it. It's awesome. Cause you, oh, I got this test. Okay. Now I have to learn this. Now I have to do this. Now I have to work on getting qualified. And so it's all a challenge, right? And then it, and it really never ends. So to me, it's extremely, it's extremely fun. Yeah, that was definitely one of the reasons why I'm attracted to this position is You'll the great. pressure and the opportunities. I think it's a really great way to grow. You will always have success. If you're one of those people that always likes a goal and a challenge, then you will always have success here. I uh, feel free to look up uh, Women in Nuclear and also North American Young Generation Nuclear. Those are two uh, networking, professional development, and outreach sites that we uh, have within Duke Energy. And it's great for uh, networking and meeting other people. That's all I got. Thanks for that. And Francis, if you join the team, you'll already know all of us. So then you can just send a note, right? <laughs> Question from the chat. We've got, can you connect what you do in engineering to the big Texas power outage? How will Texan engineers be able to fix the electrical grid? I don't know if I can talk to that one. I, I can talk a little bit unless Greta wants to take it. She's electrical. Uh, I don't know enough. Okay. <laughs> to make so, a correlation. Yeah, so, so the little bit that I've heard about it is a big challenge as far as the Texas grid goes is a lot of it was weather related. Um, if you think about Texas and when you think of Texas and the normal temperatures you see there, you're thinking very mild weather, not a lot of freezing and stuff like that. And in this case, they basically had unprecedented um, a weather event where there is a lot of freezing long term and basically kind of um, 
it, it knocked out a lot of power, a lot of um, instrumentation lines froze up plants. Uh, so they lost um, some of the natural gas plants. Uh, I went and looked up their energy profile just out of curiosity for this. And uh, it, it looks like Texas uses a lot of natural gas. Um, in that case, the plant is outdoors and they, they would have lines freeze and stuff like that just because in, if you have those sites in cold weather regions, you tend to put um, electric heat blank blankets on it basically to keep it warm. And then I know the South Texas project, that's a nuclear site that they have there actually experienced a unit trip because um, they have a turbine building. Like if you look at the picture of Raconi, you'll see a long building behind the three units. That's our turbine building and you'll see it's indoors. Um, from my understanding is the South Texas project is their turbine building is actually outdoors and exposed to the elements. And they had an instrument line freeze which caused a unit trip there. Um, also, the other thing is, is uh, depending on how much traveling you've done, you'll notice like warmer areas like in the south and also Texas, a lot of the power lines are above ground versus up north, they tend to bury them. Um, and so then in that case, since those lines are up above ground, they're exposed to tree limbs that could fall down, um, they can get icing on them and stuff like that. So a lot of it is just uh, having to repair the damage following freezing and also then preparing their grid to support seeing those temperatures in the future. Thanks for that, Jesse. Um, we've got another good question from Kelly. What was your viewpoint of nuclear power before going into college? Did you know a lot about it? Did you have a negative viewpoint like the media, media portrays? Um, and then I would add on to that, how has your view of nucle nuclear maybe changed since you started working with us? Um, I did, I'll start, Jesse, if that's okay. Uh, I didn't really, I guess when I went into nuclear engineering, I was uh, kind of wasn't very educated on it. Honestly, didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but I never really had a negative viewpoint at all. Um, like I said, I kind of went in on the nuclear medicine side uh, and you know, yeah, you're right. You do hear a lot of it, nuclear can be portrayed negatively, uh, but when you actually go through your courses and learn about um, gosh, just how it relate, how it relates to other uh, forms of forms of producing electricity, there's really no comparison. So I don't know if Jesse, did you have any, I never really had a negative connotation or any of the other engineers going through. So I can talk about it a little bit in the region. Um, in, in the county of Oconee County, we actually have a lot of positive support for nuclear energy. Um, a lot of that is because we make a lot of efforts to educate the public about nuclear. Um, we try to make sure that they understand the safety measures that we take. Um, over, over the course of the nuclear um, history is we've learned a lot of lessons along the way. Uh, you know, uh, Svetlana mentioned Chernobyl. Well, following um, Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, um, the United States actually developed INPO, which is um, an organization that uh, all the nuclear companies or, or basically nuclear owners put together to help go around and evaluate the sites. Um, before that, we also had um, the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Community, and they, they provide a lot of oversights and rules to the sites. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff as far as to learn, as far as safety systems and redundancies. Uh, we have a lot of emergency planning that we do prior to that. Uh, I know right now with COVID, everything is shut down, but in the future when it's open back again, we have the World of Energy at Oconee Nuclear Station where you can come out and do tours and learn a lot about nuclear. Um, also a documentary I encourage everyone to watch is Pandora's Promise. And basically it, it's, it takes the different um, energies uh, you can do as far as like solar and wind and nuclear and gas and really analyzes the data as far as where the risk is, what kind of um, uh, deaths you see per things. Cause I mean, every, every industry you have is gonna have risk, whether it's rate due to radiation or chemical exposure, fall hazards, stuff like that. And um, it really breaks it down of where the data lies as far as the hazards. I would probably add a little bit, uh, as you, as I, I mentioned before, I, I was, you know, a child during Chernobyl and we were impacted a lot. It was something unknown and something scary for all of us. We all got exposed to radiation, all the um, settlement of elements, uh, 
basically settled in our forests and all our food was contaminated. Uh, so we, we consumed all of that. We didn't even know what the difference, but we knew it was not good, but there is nothing you can do about it. You just continue on. Um, and, and that was the reason I wanted uh, to get into nuclear to understand uh, what happened and why. Uh, why is it safe? What is what is is it okay? Um, and as I work here, I see that there is so many safety measures. This this plant are built different. I mean, you look at the uh, um, behind the Jesse picture of the uh, rea reactor buildings. They yeah, they build off this very thick concrete uh, wall. I mean, I don't know, two feet, three feet with a metal um, liner inside and. And there is another safety feature. There is another um, concrete wall. There, there's so so much redundancy built in that it just amazes me. I I understand that I have nothing to worry about. I love working here. I know I'm 100% safe. I've been um, inside the reactor many times. First time was scary. I was thinking that I'm going to lose my hair or something like that. But there was I didn't pick up any doors at all. And um, there is no radiation around. Uh, the plan that that you know that I can I know, so I know it is safe and I that changed my perspective totally. So just from my experience. Thanks for that, Greta. Anything you'd like to add on um, your view of nuclear power before going into college versus now? Uh, I didn't really have a. I didn't know much about it, I guess we can say that. I didn't really have a positive or a negative opinion on it. I didn't really know much about it. So the, by working here now, I know so much more about it and <laughs> how safe it is and all the precaution. And like one of the systems that I've, I'm in charge of is one of, you know, one of us are important system that pretty much is there if anything happens and we make sure that it's reliable and is there for the safety of the public. So that's really my experience. Thanks, Greta. Um, one other question we have from Megan is, we spoke a little bit, Jesse, about um, the process for new operators. So what typically is the process for new nuclear engineers after graduation? So maybe a little bit on, more on the engineering department side. Yeah, um, I can cover that unless Greta or Svetlana, do you want to cover it? Go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. Um, so for engineering, it's a, a little bit less structured. Um, when you first get hired on with Duke Energy, they will sign you up for some initial training you need to do. You have to take a rad worker training and also plant access training. Um, we do have a protected area around the nuclear site. Uh, we also have a lot of rules as far as employment. Um, you can't there's lots of rules relative to how long it has to be since you drank before you came in. Um, there's a lot of rules about the narcotics you use, uh, medical reporting. Um, but basically, when, a, when any Duke employee comes in, you have to get your um, plan access training. And if you're going to be looking working in a radiation area, potential radiation area, you have to get rad worker training. And then also, you'll take all kinds of computer-based lessons. Uh, we have a central training uh, site called Kings Mountain, where uh, that's where we send people for all six of our nuclear sites to go and get some really basic site training. Uh, once you complete whatever you have to get for your work group, they'll dispatch you to the site. And then um, for most of our other employees outside of operations, uh, we try to get them within their first year of employment to take a four week systems class. Uh, and that's just because we want everyone to have a, a good basic understanding of our plant, our, our excuse me, our systems at our plant so that they, should they go out there, they can understand um, how important certain systems for us, which other ones they need to cons uh, concern themselves about the most. And then also um, every group work group has its own um, initial training for engineering. Uh, they have a lot of uh, site directives that they'll have you read. Uh, you'll get qualified to do site calcs, um, site uh, procedures, uh, you can learn how to write purchase orders. And um, besides that, usually they'll assign you a mentor and that mentor will help you get trained up on like our different computer systems and stuff like that. Greta Svetlana, you have anything to add? No, I think you covered most of it. Yeah, I think you covered it all. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all the questions that I see in the chat. Um, 
Sarah chime in if you see something I missed, but I think that's all of them. I think that's all the questions. Are there any other questions out there? Well, if not, I would like to go ahead and invite Tori to share some ways that y'all can all be involved in SWE. Hey everyone, thank you to the panelists. That was amazing. All of your stories are so inspiring. Um, I was taking notes, it was such great advice. Um, but Society of Women Engineers exists to encourage women to achieve their full potential as engineers and leaders. And um, there are chapters of SWE across the nation and the globe. So it's a professional organization and a community that you can join now and stick with throughout your entire career. Um, so if you wanna join SWE at Clemson, I'm gonna drop the link for our website in the chat and you can look and sign up and get on our email list there. But we actually have an event this Wednesday at Starbucks at Douthit, it's from five to seven. So if you wanna learn more, um, you can come out to Starbucks on Wednesday and you'll get a free drink. Um, but yeah, it's if you're interested in learning more about it, you can meet us on Wednesday or sign up online and also have my email in the chat as well if you have any questions. But we do lots of professional development events, lots of meetings with representatives from engineering companies and lots of community building if you wanna meet other women in engineering. So we'd love to see you all out with SWE soon. Thank you, Tori. And then lastly, I'd like to go ahead and invite AOE membership educator, Allie Smallwood to share some information regarding her organization. Hey everyone. Um, so just a quick blurb about AOE. Um, so AOE stands for Alpha Omega Epsilon. Um, and we're a professional and social sorority that promotes women in STEM. Um, so we have a big focus on academics and um, professionalism. Um, so we do a lot of events that are catered towards getting ready for the career fair. Um, we do a lot of study halls. Um, we have a textbook library, things like that. Um, and it was a really great way to meet women in my major um, as well as other engineering majors too. And we could kind of compare what we're going through and help each other study. Um, so that's been a really great part of AOE. Um, we also have a social aspect of AOE. So we have a great sisterhood bond in AOE. Um, we've gotten some national awards for our sisterhood at our chapter at Clemson. Um, so we do a lot of fun events like craft nights and trivia nights. Um, and things like that. Um, so if you're interested in that, we recruited um, this semester. Some of our new members are here tonight, um, but I'm gonna put my contact information in the chat. Um, if you wanna reach out to me and we can get you on our email list for recruiting um, in the fall. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Tori. Um, I just want to thank once again, can we get a round of applause in your cameras for our speakers from the Women in Nuclear and Duke Energy site? All right, excellent. Well, um, I just want to say again, thank you to um, all our fabulous women on this call. What a great message to continue to fight for that life you want. Um, meet that roadblock as just like a pivot and um, really anchor into that sisterhood. Um, what a phenomenal message. Duke Energy is a fabulous employer. I didn't want to start off the meeting with it, but my wonderful husband also works there. So perhaps I'm a, a little biased, but it does and has increased the quality of life that we have for our family and our little one here. Um, Ms. Rita, do you have anything you want to add? No, I just enjoyed it. I thank you all again, and I look forward to future collaborations. And thank you so much. And it was just a great job. So thank you. All righty. And thanks to Miss Laney for emceeing, um, for Carrie for your work, and Sarah for your work as well. That was excellent. It's hard to do virtual events, and I think we did really really fabulous job to make this a seamless effort. So I'm gonna stay on if anybody has any questions, but thank you all to our, especially our Duke Energy Woman. You're welcome to the Wise Family anytime.